Mao was awarded a Carpenter Fellowship in the Queer of Faith and Policy Learning Cohort, and she earned honors for her master's project. She also was a vice president of the Divinity School Student Government Association. After graduation, Danielle will be moving to Portland, Oregon to begin congregational internship at the Uni Unitarian Universalist Church. Congratulations, Danielle. Patrick Darmawi Iskander from San Francisco, California, is this year's Founders Medalist for the School of Engineering. He's graduating with a Bachelor of Engineering degree. Patrick's studies in electrical and computer engineering included time as a Cyber Searle Research Fellow at the Institute of Space and Defense Electronics, where he examined the effects of radiation on carbon nanotube field effect transistors. <laughs> Patrick served as president of the Amateur Radio Club and helped organize STEM outreach events, including connecting children at Monroe Carroll Junior Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt with astronauts on the International Space Station by radio. After graduation, Patrick will spend the summer as an associate engineer at SpaceX and continue his scholarship of electrical engineering and computer science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology as an NDSEG Fellow. Congratulations, Patrick. <laughs> Veronica Condiv from Nashville, Tennessee, is this year's Founders Medalist for the Graduate School. She's graduating with a Doctor of Philosophy in Neuroscience. Veronica was awarded a Ruth L. Kirschstein Pre-Doctoral Individual National Research Service Award from the National Institutes of Health, and her contributions have altered our understanding of the role of the endogenous cannabinoid system in regulating fear and anxiety behavior. Additionally, in a field in which graduate students average two to three publications, Veronica will have over 20 publications from her time at Vanderbilt. After graduation, Veronica will begin a postdoctoral fellowship at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Congratulations, Veronica. Mary Teague from Charlotte, North Carolina, is this year's Founders Medalist for this law school. She's graduating with a Doctor of Jurisprudence degree. After earning her Bachelor of Arts at Davidson College and working in the Baltimore City Public Schools as a high school history teacher and at a legal nonprofit in New York devoted to child advocacy, Mary came to Vanderbilt and studied property, land use, and environmental law. She served as the senior managing editor of Vanderbilt Law Review, was a Chancellor's Law Scholar, Vice President of the American Constitution Society, and Vice President of the Voting Rights and Advocacy Society. After graduation, Mary will be working in real estate law at Gibson Dunn in New York. Congratulations, Mary. Aisha Muhammad from Karachi, Pakistan, is this year's Founders Medalist for the School of Medicine. She's graduating with two degrees, a Doctor of Medicine and a Doctor of Philosophy in Human Genetics. Aisha earned a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at Yale, becoming the first woman in her paternal family, the first woman in her family to graduate from college and the first in her family to study outside of Pakistan. While a study at Vander student at Vanderbilt, she received a two-year pre-doctoral award from the American Heart Association and has eight peer-reviewed publications and 22 presentations to date. Ayesha was one of 10 students admitted into the Vanderbilt program in interprofessional learning, which teaches effective collaboration within interprofessional teams. After graduation, Ayesha is pursuing a career in anesthesiology at the University of Michigan Hospital in Ann Arbor. Congratulations, Aisha. <laughs> Thank you. 
Jill Kinch from Nashville, Tennessee is this year's Founders Medalist for the School of Nursing. She's graduating with a doctorate of nursing and, and sorry, a doctor of nursing practice degree. Jill earned a Master of Management in Healthcare from our own Owen Graduate School of Management, where she was named Student World Shaper. Since 2015, Jill has been Director of Advanced Practice at Monroe Carroll Junior Children's Hospital here at Vanderbilt, a role she continued while working toward her degree. Her doctoral project focuses on care for children undergoing tracheostomy. Yes. <laughs> and it will ultimately enhance the care of those vulnerable patients. After graduation, Jill will continue as Director of Advanced Practice at Children's Hospital and will focus on developing pediatric organ transplant service. Congratulations, Jill. So many things you learn as provost. Ashley Detheridge from Zionsville, Indiana, is this year's Founders Medalist for the Owen Graduate School of Man Management. She's graduating with a Master of Business Administration degree. Now a double door, Ashley earned her Bachelor of Science here at Vanderbilt in Child Development in 2017. Before attending Owen, she worked as a nurse at Vanderbilt's neonatal intensive care unit. Her concentrations in her MBA studies include healthcare and operations and analytics. Ashley worked with Nashville Sexual Assault Center via the Owen Board Fellows Program, which allows Vanderbilt MBA students to serve as non-voting board members at nonprofits for a year. In the fall, she will join the Nashville office of the Boston Consulting Group. Congratulations, Ashley. Sarah Elizabeth Johansson from Greenville, South Carolina is this year's Founders Medalist for Peabody College. She's graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree. Sarah was a Cornelius Vanderbilt Scholar and President of Kappa Delta Pi Education Honor Society. In the summer of 2022, Johansson taught English at a nonprofit school in Athens, Greece, working with refugee teenagers without English experience through the Peabody Scholars Program. As a three-time VU Scepter student orientation leader, she mentored more than 70 first-year students and won the Peabody Diversity and Inclusion Grant for her work in collaboration with the Nashville Book Connection, a program that nurtures elementary students' reading. After graduation, she will teach kindergarten at Nashville Glenview Elementary School. Congratulations, Sarah. Congratulations again to all of our Founders Medalists on these remarkable achievements. I'd now like to welcome, oh yes, we could applaud, sorry. <laughs> I'd now like to welcome members of our Interfaith Council to speak, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Malik El Masiri. My four years of involvement in the Vanderbilt Interfaith Council have taught me many valuable lessons, including the importance of dialogue. Effective dialogue strikes a delicate balance between finding value in our individual experiences and demonstrating the humility to acknowledge the bounds of our own knowledge. Class of 2023, as we venture out into this vast world, I hope that we all strike this delicate balance and turn both inward and outward for inspiration and wisdom. In that spirit, I would now like to welcome our, our Hindu faith speaker, Ashika Kuchangi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashika Dilip Kuchangi, and I'm a representative of the Vanderbilt Hindu religious organization, Vandi Karma. One of the main tenets of the Bhagavad Gita, the principal Hindu religious text, is to do your duty. Class of 2023, as you take your next steps forward in life, 
whether that is graduate school, your career, or something entirely different, pursue this journey with the same intense excitement you had when you stepped foot on Vanderbilt's campus. On your path, recognize that part of your duty is to yourself. Prioritize your physical and mental health because they are pillars to your success. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Carly Stewart, and I served as Vanderbilt Hillel's president this year. In the Jewish text, Pirkei Avot, translated as Ethics of Our Fathers, Rabbi Hillel said, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? But if I'm only for myself, what, I, what am I? And if not now, when? As we begin our postgraduate lives, it is important that we not only advocate for ourselves, but also for those around us. The Jewish faith teaches of tikkun olam, repairing the world. And our Vanderbilt education has prepared us to advocate for ourselves and others. Congratulations, class of 2023. Hi, my name is Hannah Marr, and I am president of Vanderbilt Wesley Fellowship. Over the last four years, Vandy Wesley has offered me a community full of people who share similar beliefs, yet have questions they want to explore about their faith. Much of what we will encounter in life is unknown to us right now, but one thing we can always rely on is God's unconditional love to offer us guidance. My hope is that as we cross the stage tomorrow and leave Vanderbilt behind, we will not forget the communities we have found here, nor the fact that no matter what we face, we will always have someone in our corner. I leave you with Jeremiah 29, 11, a verse that has ground me in this time of uncertainty. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessings be upon each and every one of you. I'm Namra Ajmal, and I'm the president of the Muslim Students Association. In Islam, we have this concept, this obligation to share the wealth, where wealth doesn't just refer to financial resources, but rather anything good you have in abundance, anything good you've been blessed with. When we leave here tomorrow, we will each leave with a wealth of knowledge. So I urge myself, and I urge all of you, to take what you've learned here, whom you've met here, and how you've grown here, and use it to change our societies and our world for the better. I would now like to introduce the Vanderbilt Student Government President, Amisha Mittal. Thank you, Namra, for that introduction. I remember when I told my parents that I was gonna give this speech at Graduates Day. Their response was, that's great, but when's the real graduation? <laughs> Clearly, they couldn't contain their excitement. But let me tell you, Graduate Day is just as important as graduation, or at least that's what I keep telling myself since I'm only speaking here. <laughs> my name is Amisha Matal, and it is my extreme honor to be addressing you all for the final time today as your student body president. I want to express my deepest gratitude for each of you being here to celebrate this milestone with us. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our dedicated professors, our supported families and friends, and of course, the stars of the show, the class of 2023. We made it! As we reflect on our journey, we can all find inspiration in the stories that brought us here. For me, that story began with my parents. In 1994, my parents arrived in the United States with limited English and only the clothes on their backs, driven by one thing, education. Their relentless pursuit of knowledge became the foundation of my own academic journey. From the moment I stepped foot on campus, I knew wherever I went and whatever I did, I would owe it to them. They propelled me to fight for my dreams and make them proud. And today, with an overwhelming sense of pride, I stand before you as Vanderbilt's first ever Indian woman to serve as Vanderbilt student body president. Moreover, I'm deeply grateful for all the faculty, staff, friends, relatives, and parents gathered here today for their own sacrifices and believing in the transformative power of education. 
Now I know you're probably wondering where the years have gone. It feels like it was just yesterday when the young adults we honor today were nervous wrecks arriving at their common's house, greeted with the chants and screams of upperclassmen, learning just how fearless the Vandy squirrels are. Thanks, Garfield. We arrived on campus as starry-eyed first years, hoping to end up in Hank Hotel, but realizing East is beast. <laughs> Our first year seemed to have everything we could want and more. 24-7 munchie, the pub, and late night dining. Then, the day after spring break, they said, this is going a little too well. Let's shake things up a bit. So we went home for eternity, or what felt like it. Sophomore year, we came back COVID pros. We made the weekly trek to the rec for COVID tests and turned our dorms into makeshift classrooms. Then, junior year, many of us took the opportunity to go abroad and party I mean study. <laughs> and this year alone, we had to make up for lost time. We attended Rites of Spring for the first time. We celebrated Vanderbilt's 150th anniversary. The bowling team just became national champs. <laughs> and somehow we managed to get Wesley banned after decades of its existence. If there's anything I've learned from our unpredictable four years here, is that we rise to the occasion with a fierce sense of pride. We are proud to be Commodores. And that pride doesn't stop. It doesn't stop when we get our diplomas mailed to us a month from now. And it doesn't stop when we're 70 years old, still wearing our Vanderbilt alumni t-shirts to the airport. Our journey here might end tomorrow, but the friendships we've made will carry us a lifetime. Class of 2023, soak this in, Let's keep making our mark wherever life takes us, not forgetting to hug our loved ones along the way. Thank you, Vanderbilt, for taking a chance on us. To everyone on this lawn, I wish you the absolute best of luck in your future endeavors. You're amazing and you will kill it. And as always, anchor down. And now, I'd like to introduce our graduate student speaker, Lea Namoke Nakon. Good morning, faculty, staff, administrators, and families. To my fellow graduates, whether you started your program like me amid a solar eclipse or during a pandemic, if you are here today, it means that you pursued academic excellence under uncertain times. Let us take a deep breath of gratitude for we are here. Indeed, we have the honor of graduating as Vanderbilt celebrates its 150th anniversary, un united under the commitment to dare to grow. Dare to grow has a radically optimistic feel to it for me as a first generation African whose ancestors at the time of the university's founding in 1873 could not have imagined this moment in their wildest dreams. As a granddaughter of sharecroppers who tilled soil that was not their own in the shadows of the Appalachian Blue Ridge Mountains, Dare to Grow is a reminder of the futuristic faith needed to sow seeds that will yield a harvest that one may never taste. As the, the great granddaughter of Adangbe farmers who gathered to mill cassava and share sacred wisdom on the Ghanaian Gold Coast, Dare to Grow is a reminder of the disciplined stewardship needed to required to harvest a substance that will support a beloved community. Who are the people who dared to sow that you might reap the harvest of this moment right here, right now? I'm blessed to say that beyond my familial ties, I was welcomed into an academic community that dared to grow and dared to sow in students like me. This community includes scholars like Dr. Victor Anderson, who created space for me to develop innovative approaches to humanistic inquiry. It includes my dissertation co-chair, Dr. Keith Metter, who helped me challenge healthcare to live up to its name as an institution of health and care. It includes womanist scholars like Dean Emily Towns, Dr. Stacey Floyd Thomas, and Dr. Phyllis Shepard, who taught me to do, as Dr. Katie Cannon says, tell the kind of truth that makes your, that stings like a serpent's tooth the kind of truth that makes your teeth itch. As we move into the beautiful chaos of celebrating graduation, I invite you to take mo micro moments of reflection around what it means to dare to grow. I hope you reflect about how you have, as the term discipline indicates, learned practices and tools that allow you to continue to grow professionally and personally throughout every season of your life. 
My second invitation is to reflect on how you will dare to grow others. Are you willing to put in the work to make space for others who are quite like or unlike you? How are you intentionally sowing and stewarding your gifts in a ways that will benefit those that follow you? For me, this was actually quite literal. Although I study birth inequity, I dared to grow a tiny human and defended my dissertation proposal with, with her strapped to my, test, my chest. My commitment to impacting the world of bioethics is a commitment to making the world a better place for her generation. Oh, we've got some rain. So finally, I will conclude by saying, I hope you reflect on you might, how you might anchor down and dare to grow deep and wide roots as a form of radical self and communal care. How can you dare to grow the kind of beloved communities that defy expectations and boundaries? What nutrients can you provide your community? And what do you need from those around you, including maybe an umbrella? <laughs> so my work in ecological systems theory cautions us that we're only as strong as those around us and that the most beautiful work happens under the soil and because of the things like the rain. My dear fellow graduates, for you and those who love you that have dared to grow so that this season might be of a harvest, may you find time to honor the investment and move into the next season with the wild dreams, the disciplined stewardship, and the futuristic faith of a farmer. I would now like to introduce the Seniors Give Back speaker, Morgan Patty. Good morning, everyone. My name is Morgan Patty. In this past year, I've had the pleasure of serving as the Seniors Give Back president of our class of 2023. Seniors Give Back is a pretty, or, pretty special organization here at Vandy that provides students with the opportunity to give back to the areas of campus that most shaped their experience while here at Vanderbilt. And by giving directly to the parts of campus that impacted us the most, students can help ensure future successes for generations of Commodores to come. This year, I'm so proud to announce that Vanderbilt's class of 2023 was able to cure, secure a strong participation rate among seniors. Although our time on campus has been untraditional in many ways, these generous gifts from individual students have helped impact have helped impact Vanderbilt and will build a unique legacy that will last far beyond our years here. Thank you to each and every student that made a gift, big or small. Before I hand over the mic, I want to express my gratitude to our amazing officers, Sophia, Bianca, Leah, and Vanessa, for their tireless work in leading this effort. To our wonderful advisor, Crandell Kager, thank you so much for your endless support and dedication. You have just arrived at Vanderbilt with us here, and already your, your contribution has impacted so many, including myself. Finally, and certainly not least, I want to ex extend a generous thank you to Robert and Diane Lev Lev Levy for their generous donation of an additional $100,000 to exper experience Vanderbilt in honor of the class of 2023. Although this chapter of our lives concludes officially as we walk across the stage tomorrow, we can take pride in the fact that we have left our mark on Vanderbilt University. On behalf of the class of 2023, I am so honored to present this small representation of our hard work and journey together. So cheers to you, 23, and anchor down. I'd now like to introduce our Alumni Association President, Anu Pardeshi. Good morning. Uh, the class of 22 was a lot louder than that. Good morning. Good morning. It looks absolutely amazing from up here to see all the umbrellas and all of you. So I don't know if you can see it or if there's a way to shoot that, but it's incredible. And come on, Cornelius, make it stop raining. <laughs> Worth a shot. It is my honor to be with you all on this special day. My name is Anu Pardeshi, and I am the president of the Vanderbilt Alumni Association. Like many Vanderbilt alumni, I owe much of my life's trajectory to this place. I am one of the small number of alumni who can call myself a triple door. I have earned three degrees from Vanderbilt University, and if you would believe it, my wife, Dr. Natalie Curcio, is a quadruple door. She has four degrees from the university and is a proud adjunct professor at the School of Medicine. Zero pressure on my kids. 
It is hard to believe that 23 years ago, I was preparing for my own undergraduate commencement, thinking about how the last four years had flown by, mostly. Reflecting on the wonderful friends I had made and feeling extremely grateful for the top-notch education I had received, both in the classroom and outside of it, knowing even then that I would not realize its full value until many years later when I had some real-world experiences under my belt. Many emotions ran through my heart and mind. I was a little melancholy, sad to be leaving the campus and the wonderful community of which I had become a part as I was about to close this chapter in my life for good. However, I was enthusiastic and optimistic for what the future would hold and how the next chapter in my story would begin. What I hadn't realized at that point, and what you may not realize yet either, is that leaving this campus as a college graduate does not mean you're leaving Vanderbilt. Some of you may even come back for more education. Wherever you go next, whatever you do after graduation, Vanderbilt is for life. In its humble but promising beginnings, Vanderbilt's alumni base consisted of 61 men entering the medical field. Now, nearly 150 years later, we are a diverse network of nearly 150,000 influential Vanderbilt alumni around the globe. We are still doctors, but now we are also CEOs of major companies, scientists, social and tech entrepreneurs, musicians, nurses, elected officials, film producers, teachers, scholars, and other leaders in nearly every industry imaginable. On behalf of all these 150,000 alumni around the world, let me be one of the first to welcome you all to the Vanderbilt Alumni Association. You are automatic members for life, and you have earned it. There are never dues to pay, and everything is open to everyone. We are so proud of you. And I suspect there are more than a few parents, siblings, and grandparents in the audience who are also thrilled and so proud to see you reach this important milestone in your life. It may seem daunting to leave these familiar faces and places behind, but trust me, they have prepared you well. All of the time spent here has helped you refine skills, acquire knowledge, and develop talents that will help you thrive and succeed no matter where you go or what you do as you continue your journey onward. Furthermore, your network also has expanded exponentially. No longer is it just your classmates graduating alongside you. You join Vanderbilt's alumni community that spans the globe and stands ready to help you make connections, create a sense of belonging in your new city, and celebrate your successes right alongside you. With alumni in over 140 countries and counting, you will find fellow Commodores everywhere. So when you go to grad school or take your first job, whether here in Nashville or in a new city, be sure to connect with the alumni there, especially in Vanderbilt chapters. Keep your email address and address details current on VU Connect to receive Vanderbilt invites and news in your city. Remember. If the only address Vanderbilt has for you is at your parents' home, you won't get information about local alumni events while you are working in New York City. Join the Vanderbilt LinkedIn group to grow your professional network. I know you all are experts at keeping in touch via social media, so please make the effort to keep in touch. Like most things in life, the more effort you put into making connections, the more you'll get out of it. So I hope you'll attend events, make meaningful connections, and volunteer your time. Every class of graduating students stands on the shoulders of generous alumni who have come before. Their support has enriched your experience here, from funding Opportunity Vanderbilt scholarships and Experience Vanderbilt, to supporting outstanding faculty through endowed chairs and helping build the Commons and Residential Colleges experience. Through your support with various class gifts and continued Vanderbilt engagement, you have already acknowledged the importance of giving back and paying it forward. I encourage you to always stay engaged to help past, current, and future students succeed as you have. And remember, if you want to give back, no gift is insignificant. It takes all of us to make this Vanderbilt community thrive. 
Graduation or commencement may seem like a conclusion, but it is also a beginning. The word comes from the French commencer, to begin or start. Now, you are ready to take and to begin to lay your next footprints on the world's uncharted paths and make your mark. And remember, you're never alone out there. Welcome to your alumni association, your alumni family. Vanderbilt is for life indeed. I'd like to introduce Chancellor Daniel Deermeyer, an internationally renowned political scientist and management scholar. Daniel Deermeyer is the ninth chancellor of Vanderbilt University. Since joining Vanderbilt in 2020, Chancellor Deermeyer has led an ambitious program of growth and advancement. Under his visionary leadership, the university has risen in stature, successfully launched a record $3.2 billion capital campaign topped the $1 billion mark in research funding for the first time in the university's history, and reaffirmed its long-standing commitment to free expression and civil discourse. He has driven efforts to become the destination for leading faculty and the most promising students, to create a culture of radical collaboration and personal growth for Vanderbilt's faculty, students, and staff, and to expand Vanderbilt's global presence. Under his leadership, Vanderbilt was one of a very small number of the nation's universities to safely and successfully bring students back to campus during the COVID-19 pandemic. Before arriving at Vanderbilt, Chancellor Deermeyer served in leadership and faculty roles at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University, and at the University of Chicago, where he was served as Dean of the Harris School of Public Policy and subsequently as Provost. Please join me in welcoming Chancellor Daniel Deermeyer. Good morning, graduates. Rain is just stopping on time, perfect. It's a pleasure to be with you as we begin these ceremonies marking your passage from Vanderbilt students to Vanderbilt alumni. And as you embark on that journey, I can think of few speakers more fitting for our current moment than Maria Ressa. Today, free speech and civil discourse are more imperiled than they have ever been in my lifetime. In countries around the world, and here in our own, Factions spent on stifling debate and dissent and on spreading misinformation for political gain are ascendant with powerful technology at their disposal. Countering them requires that all of us, in the circumstances of our own lives, show the kind of commitment and courage that Maria Ressa demonstrated throughout her extraordinary career. Her example should embolden and inspire us all. At Vanderbilt, we have a fierce and long-standing commitment to free expression, open inquiry, and civil discourse. Throughout your time here, we have asked you to embrace diversity in thought, to remain open to the gentle force of the better argument. We have asked you to seek first to understand before rushing to righteousness and moral judgment. And we've asked you to trade in evidence and facts. We've asked you to embrace these things because there are nothing else than the lifeblood of education. Without them, transformative education and path-breaking research are all but impossible. During the free speech debates of the late 1960s, Alexander Hurd, Vanderbilt's fifth chancellor, noted that, and I quote, a university's obligation is not to protect students from ideas, rather than to expose them to ideas and to help them capable of handling and hopefully have ideas of their own. And of course, free expression and civil discourse are not only the lifeblood of education, they are essential for democracy and a pluralistic 
society. The skills you have honed as students will also serve you well as citizens and as leaders. From our classrooms to our laboratories, from our residential cottages to our lecture and performance halls, Vanderbilt stands proudly and unequivocally for free expression, open inquiry, intellectual diversity, and thoughtful civil discourse. And with that, it is a particular honor for me to introduce Maria Ressa. Maria has been a journalist in Asia for nearly 35 years. She co-founded Rappler, the top digital-only news site that is leading the fight for press freedom in the Philippines. As Rappler's executive editor and CEO, Maria has endured constant political harassment and arrest by the Duterte government. She has been forced to post bail eight times to stay free. Her battle for truth and democracy is the subject of the 2020 Sundance Film Festival documentary, A Thousand Cuts. Most recently, Maria co-founded the Real Facebook Oversight Board, composed of 25 academics, journalists, and activists, and created to rival the social media's platform's own board. For her courage and work against disinformation, Maria was named Time Magazine's 2013 Person of the Year, was among it's 100 most influential people of 2019 and has also been named one of the times, one of times most influential women of the century. She was part of BBC's 100 most inspiring and influential women of 2019 and Prospect Magazine World's top 50 thinkers. A lot of numbers here, but well deserved. Among many awards, she has received the prestigious Golden Pen of Freedom Award from the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers, the Knight International Journalism Award from the International Center for Journalists, the Gwen Ifill Press Freedom Award from the Committee to Protect Journalists, the Shorenstein Journalism Award from Stanford University, the Columbia Journalism Award, the Free Media Pioneer Award from the International Press Institute, and the Sergei Magnitsky Award for Investigative Journalism. Before founding Rappler, Maria investigated terrorism in Southeast Asia. She opened and ran CNN's Manila Bureau for nearly a decade before opening the network's Jakarta Bureau, which she ran from 1995 to 2005. She wrote Seeds of Terror, an eyewitness account of Al-Qaeda's newest center of operations in Southeast Asia, and From Bin Laden to Facebook, 10 years of abduction, 10 years of terrorism. And in 2021, Maria Ressa was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Please join me in welcoming Maria Ressa. I'm short, <laughs> so um, thank you, thank you so much. Oh my God, I'm so glad the rain stopped for you. <laughs> um, thank you. Chancellor Deermeyer, Provost Raven, members of the board, faculty, oh my gosh, Ed and Janice Nichols, um, and hello, class of 2023. Congratulations. I mean, you know, you have to like fill these moments, you know, just stop a second. Well, first of all, I was, while I was sitting back there, I was thinking, oh my God, like when the rain started, I was like, this is a perfect metaphor for our world today. But let me add a few things. You know, the rain can start at any moment. You're armed with your umbrella. But then, you know, when I heard the planes coming through, and then I heard the siren, we can also add maybe bombs falling, and maybe the earth, possibility of an earthquake opening up. 
And then you have a kind of interesting metaphor of the time we live in today and what you will face as the graduating class of 2023. Yeah, I, I promise I won't depress you all the way. <laughs> um, so please, while you're with your family right now, while you're with your friends, like take a minute, breathe in, feel the moment when there's no rain, where the weather is just right, and exhale. Live in this moment. Because what gives your attention, uh, what gets your attention, is actually what gives your life, our lives, meaning. Where you spend your time determines what you accomplish, what you become good at. That's really important to keep in mind as the battle for your mind, and this is happening right now, is one actually not with ideas. You know, that's where you, you need to realize it's not your thinking slow part that's gonna be targeted. It's your emotions. It is not the way you feel this moment. It isn't that triumphant feeling. It isn't the feeling of love. It is fear, anger, hate. What I call toxic sludge in the Nobel lecture is what is pumping through our information ecosystem. It keeps you scrolling on your phones, right? That's the business model because when you're angry, when you're feeling hate, you wind up scrolling more and those algorithms continue to give you more. That's the business model. Algorithms, opinion in code, right? And that business model is surveillance for profit. But all of this just makes it significantly harder for you to deal with the challenge that faced all the generations ahead of you. 150 years, holy cow. Okay, and what is that challenge? It is how to build meaning into your life. Because meaning isn't something you stumble across, nor is it something you read in one book, nor is it something someone gives you. Your parents can't give you meaning, right? They'll give you bits and pieces of it, but you build it. You build this sense of meaning through every choice you make, through the commitments, that you nurture, the friendships you make, the people you love, and the values you live by. I heard so many fantastic values while I was sitting on the stage, but that's the first step. You are graduating at this existential moment, you know, the earth waiting to open up, the rain waiting to, for, to fall, the planes coming at you, now more than ever, we know that information is power. In Ukraine, those air raid sirens let them know when they need to, to run to a shelter. But at the same time, it happens so frequently that sometimes they tune it out, right? So you need information like that. Without the right information, it's impossible to fight back, whether it's to find a cure for a disease, for the climate, or my job, to hold power to account. We need to fight this insidious manipulation that social media platforms have allowed, and they do it for tremendous profit. Um, a 2018 MIT study told you why. Lies spread at least six times faster than those really boring facts. Um, and if you lace it with anger and hate, it spreads even faster. So these lies are like a virus. It's infected our information ecosystem and it plays to the worst of our human nature, right? It's turning us against each other. They replicate and cripple our body politic, encouraging us to become our worst selves. A lie told a million times becomes a fact. 
Now these next three sentences I've said over and over and over since 2016, it took me years to get there. Um, we examined data, it was from the Philippines, but it, it, it fits you here in the United States, it fits everywhere in the United States. And we got this data living through these dark experiences. Um, at the Nobel lecture, I said them, and please let me say them to you again. Without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without these three, we have no shared reality. We cannot solve any problems. We cannot have democracy. So for example, if I was to do information operations and pound on social media that this Vanderbilt exercise right now that you're listening to me in the Philippines, if I pound it a million times and you're only saying Vanderbilt you only tweets once, guess where this is being held? People will believe it's in the Philippines, right? This is where free speech is used to stifle free speech. This is the co-opting of meaning. AI, artificial intelligence, has beaten humanity every single time. There's been two main times. I just described the first time. This is in social media where it's just machine learning. This is a curation part of it, right? It's, it determines what you get on your feed. It determines who become your friends. And those choices that were built by design by the platforms have actually a friends of friends algorithm polarized us and were radicalized by just keeping you scrolling. Okay, so these have created cascading failures that has turned our politics all around the world into a gladiator's battle to the death, along with a slew of social harms that we have yet to deal with, including how globally we are electing illiberal leaders democratically and they are crushing institutions of democracy in their own countries, but they're not staying there. They're allying. So that's part of, you know, I, I say that in the doomsday clock of democracy, we're in the last two minutes. I know I'm pounding you with all the bad news. Um, but we didn't learn from the first time we released the curation AI, right? What did we just do? And Vanderbilt knows this. Last December, generative AI, far more complex and sophisticated, was released into the wild, into the public sphere. It's a real-time experiment that will further test our societies and your humanity. If the first generation, the curation, this one is creation, right? And it still has no guardrails to protect all of us. Will the responsibility of protecting us be left in the hands of the people who are rushing ahead for profit? Look at what they've done, right? Uh, show of hands. How many of you have tried chat GPT or any AI? Yes, it is fantastic in many ways, right? You can get rid of, a friend was just telling me her daughter uses it to get rid of like those boring letters, form letters, and then they can concentrate on other stuff. But don't forget one thing, that those kinds of boring letters are like going to the gym before you run a marathon, right? That this boring stuff is like the technical exercises on, on the piano before you actually play an amazing masterpiece. The creativity comes from technical exercises. ChatGPT in two months hit over 100 million users. So yeah, it's great, right? What you may not know is that a few months before that happened, before it was released to all of us, a survey in Silicon Valley actually said, this, this is the, these are the folks, about eight, 800 people, folks who work on this AI, said that 50% of them believed that if they release this as is to us, that there was a 10% or greater chance that it would lead to an extinction event. That's of us, right, of humanity. 
okay, now you understand why I say the earth could open up, the bomb could fall, the rain could keep coming, and, uh, and let's add a tornado in there, right? It's bleak. But, of course, we can't give up. This reminds me of the time in 1986 or 87 where our own lawyers, uh, you know, Rappler is a small news organization. We're only about 100 people. Our median age is young. It's 23 years old. Um, and our lawyers told me, you know, Maria, you're crazy to fight Duterte, our president in the Philippines. But I, I kept saying, I'm not fighting Duterte. I'm just doing my job. Uh, and it was crazy what I had to be prepared to sacrifice just to do my job. This is kind of the world we live in. Like the first time I got arrested, and, and this is also interesting for you, because the arresting officers, there were about a dozen of them who came into the Rappler newsroom that I, I mentioned 23 years old is our median age, right? The officer said, ma'am, trabaho lang po ito. This is only, I'm only doing my job, ma'am. Uh, that's what the arresting officer kept repeating over and over. Then he lowered his voice to almost a whisper as he read me my Miranda rights. Um, he was clearly uncomfortable, and I almost felt sorry for him, except he was arresting me, right? Uh, this is the last act in a chain of events that were meant to intimidate and harass me because I'm a journalist. This officer was a tool of power and an example of how a good man can turn evil and how great atrocities happen. Hannah Arendt wrote this in The Banality of Evil, right, when describing men who carried out the orders of Hitler in Nazi Germany, how these career-oriented bureaucrats can act without conscience because they say they're only following orders. This is how a nation loses its soul. I know this firsthand. In 2019, I was arrested twice in about a month. I posted bail eight times in about three months. Two more came soon after that. I have 10 arrest warrants, right? I committed no crime except to be a journalist and to hold power to account. But I do have some good news of those 10 criminal cases. I mean, it, it took a while, but it is now seven of those cases are gone. You just have to stay the course. So I have three left. In order to be here to speak to you today, I had to ask for approval from the Supreme Court of the Philippines. And I can't say anything more than that because those are the conditions of my travel. Um, let's, so let me pull out broader. I have really seen how government bureaucracy, our legal system, were weaponized against perceived critics. Right? If people don't like you, be careful. My rights as a citizen and as a journalist were violated, and I demand justice. So why am I telling you all this? Because the question people always ask me is, you know, so. How do you find courage? Because you're going to need it to deal with the earth maybe opening, the skies pouring, a tornado coming, and bombs dropping. Well, just like small acts can turn you evil, courage draws from small acts. So let me share three lessons that hard won, and I hope that they help you as you battle for your identity and meaning. The first, draw the line. If you've heard me speak, I say this all the time. Draw the line for your values. Two, embrace your fear. Three, build your community. I heard this community, but beware the mob. So the first, draw the line. Life is all about making choices. That's what we do every minute of the day. Are you gonna open the umbrella? Or are you gonna shut it? Are you going to go inside so you're near the building or not, right? These little choices define who you are. And if you're not clear about your values, you could wake up when you're older and realize that, oh, you don't like the person you've become. Every choice defines who you are. 
And they could be really simple, like choosing to turn left instead of right, but they lead to different paths. Or you, know, you could justify accepting a bribe because we can rationalize anything. You've rationalized, it's a gift. Or if you're a tech mogul, you can say the genocide in Myanmar has nothing to do with the profit motive of social media. Character is created in the sum of all these little choices we make. So please now, while you're sitting there, be clear. Choose the values that define you. Do it now. Because when you're tested, and it will come if it hasn't already, you have to know the lines you've set. You have to draw the line where on this side, you're good, and this side, you're evil. This clarity is what prevents situational ethics. This makes sure you can't rationalize greed or bad behavior. One of the things I've learned is that you don't really know who you are until you're forced to fight for it, until you have to defend it. Then every battle you win or lose, every compromise you choose to make or, or to walk away from, all of these struggles define the values you live by and ultimately who you are, right? When you're in the battle, avoid the hate, the us against them, tribalism, what sociolo sociologists call in-group versus out-group. Right? It's the best way to rile you up. And we see our politicians all around the world using this. It is easy to, you know, it's easy to be a populist. It's much harder to be a real leader find what we all have in common. That's actually what the tech companies proved to us, right? Because regardless of nation state boundaries, of culture, of religion, they use the same companies, the same um, principles to attack our biology. They actually proved that we have far more in common than we have differences. It was just used to manipulate us. Um, we have to find what we all have in common because that is our humanity. Alone we accomplish very little, no matter how bright or talented you are. It's about what we can do together to find what binds us together. We build a stronger democracy by strengthening our common humanity. Sorry, I can talk about this forever. But let me move to the second one, right? What's the second one? Embrace your fear. I've been asked a lot, aren't you afraid? Why are you not afraid? People seem to want to see me cry, and sometimes I do. <laughs> but of course I'm afraid. I get frightened. I've had these moments. But I was trained, and this is part of those 10,000 hours, right? I was a conflict reporter. I was a war zone correspondent. I planned the way in, and I chart the way out of any field of battle. I've learned in a conflict zone that if you clump together and someone is afraid, it spreads. Fear spreads and it is debilitating. And when you are in the battle, fear is a luxury. So if you're in the middle of chaos, of uncertainty, and we will be, you need to stamp down your fear to have this clarity of thought that's essential to make the right decision. And the way to do that is to think ahead, to define, right? This, I always talk about the seven Ps, proper preparation prevents poor performance. Whatever you're most afraid of, touch it, hold it, embrace it. Because once you do that, nothing can stop you. As you move forward in life, the more power you gain, the more people will try to coerce, manipulate, intimidate, or threaten you to get what they want. Often they have a lot at stake. You know, it could just be money, or it could be power, or it could be their lives. 
And you have to be clear about what you're afraid of because those are the buttons they'll push. You know, on social media, when I was getting attacks of 90 hate messages per hour, they tried everything, but I'm not corrupt. So they went to how I look, how I sounded. I have eczema, very dry skin. And so at one point, they took a decapitated, they took my head and put it on top of human genitals, and it spread. Uh, they called me scrotum face. Uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Nietzsche was right. <laughs> so dealing with fear started there for me, these exponential attacks on social media. Two years later, Time Magazine actually, you, they pulled journalists. It was the first time journalists were recognized for what we were, what we were trying to do. So when I was person of the year, they called us the guardians of truth. But when I looked at the people who were there, I realized I was the only one who was both free and alive. Uh, <laughs> it shouldn't be that difficult. Then the cases started really coming, and I realized that jail was real. More than 100 years that time, my lawyer, Amal Clooney, who spoke to a graduating class a few years ago, told me, um, or it could be violence. Manila traffic is really hard. You know, targeted assassinations happen when a motorcycle with two riders comes and then one of the guys just pumps bullet into the car. You can't move, right? So I had to imagine the worst things. It took me more than a month to confront, to imagine. I made a list. What were my worst fears? And I embraced them because then I could move ahead. I hated that the baton was passed to me at this time, right? The leadership of a news group being a journalist, that it required being prepared to do this, but it's almost like us being here and preparing for the earth to swallow us up, uh, the rain to come, a typhoon or hurricane to come. I keep going to that to say that we're not that different, that the world has become incredibly more dangerous than it has ever been. So imagine the worst case scenarios. For me, I did it, I embraced it, I'm okay with it, and I can move on. I robbed it of its power. So prepare for the worst, but you gotta hope for the best, right? The third, finally, beware the mob. This is the worst of human nature, and social media mobs are the norm now. Remember again that MIT study that lies laced with anger and hate spread fastest on social media, forming lynch mobs. That is by design. If you know this, hopefully you can be better prepared. Switch out of thinking fast to thinking slow. Slow down and think. Use that Vanderbilt education. Fight for your best self. You know, in, in the Nobel lecture, I, I, I pulled out a, a t-shirt that we had in Rappler that said, you know, in order to be the good, you have to believe in the good. You have to believe that people are basically good, and they are. It's worth mentioning something else that this technology we live with encourages, and, and that is, be careful, it isn't always about you. <laughs> you know, being on every social media platform, carefully curating your life, sometimes you get the notion that it is about you. You have to be confident, but don't cross into arrogance. Aim for the empty mirror. Uh, you heard about the Bhagavad Gita at some point, right? It, the empty mirror is like the Buddhist version of Plato's myth of the cave. It was a book I read coming out of college, and I still remember it. What is it? That when you look into the mirror, you see the world reflected, and that you have enough confidence that your image doesn't obstruct the world you see, right? The empty mirror, a reflection of the world not just of your beautiful self. <laughs> know that no matter how much of a superstar you are, you cannot accomplish anything meaningful alone. Build and strengthen your community. 
I'll leave you with one of the toughest moral choices I've had to make. This one was in East Timor, and it was a long time ago. I was in my mid-30s. Uh, yes, that was decades ago. I still remember it today, though. It was in the final days of the Indonesian military scorched earth policy. East Timor is Asia's largest, its newest nation and, and, uh, and a Roman Catholic nation, right? So at this point, the Timorese were fighting for their independence and, and the Indonesian military had a scorched earth policy and they were killing the pro-independence supporters. My team and I were leaving the capital, Dili, to head to Suwai, which was about four hours away by car. I was told that there had been a massacre, hundreds who had taken shelter in the church. And the reason that I knew was, and I had a special interest at that point, was also because the person who called me reminded me that the head of the church, Father Hilario, was Filipino, right? We were about halfway there, so, you know, at least 45 minutes to an hour out, no less than halfway, when we stopped for gas. And a man, this is in the town of Liquisha, a friend of mine, a source, came out very agitated and he asked me for a ride back to Dili because he said he was being hunted and he feared for his life. I couldn't turn the car around because we needed to get to Suwai. The reports of the violence were getting stronger. I was now getting more calls. I couldn't bring him with us to Suwai because that would be bringing him to the military that he was afraid of and it would make my entire team vulnerable, right? Our first responsibility was to get the story to our global audience. So I told him we could pick him up that evening on our way back to Dili. We got to the church. There was a massacre. It was an extremely long and grueling day. When we drove back, we got to our designated meeting point. We were an hour late, so I waited an hour longer. He didn't show up. And it was weeks later when I found out that he had been killed. I have many memories like this through it's actually 37 years of being a journalist. And whatever profession you choose, you will have these moments, right? Where it's not so clear what's right and wrong. And you always have to ask yourself, did I do the right thing? In situations of anarchy and war, it is hard to distinguish right from wrong. And you know, make no mistake, for the first time in a very long time, we have conventional war, Russia at the Ukraine again. But more than that, I would say it is an individual. The battle is in your pocket. The battle is each of us dealing with our own demons, right? So you have to be very clear in order to distinguish right from wrong. There is only your mission, there is only the purpose, why you are there. So what gives your life meaning? At a time of fragmentation, of a flattening of meaning, you know, we talked about these, how words now have been co-opted, how a very word like democracy is now being used by China and it is changing the meaning, it is flattening meaning, so we have to be clear. This is the time when the baton is being handed to you. It is going to get worse before it gets better, which is why you have to prepare yourselves because this time matters. Know that this is in your hands and you are prepared. This is what Vanderbilt has done for you. Unfortunately, you will have to fix what my generation has broken. But you're not alone. Look to your left. Look for your friends. Look for your family. Look to your right. Decades after my own graduation, from half a world away, 
The people I sat next to when I was in your seat rallied to our cause. They rallied around the values we defined when we were where you were, when we were sitting in your place. I don't think I'd be standing in front of you today if we at Rappler didn't have that support. I've lost some freedom, but we're winning the fight. It took years before I began to clear my name, but January this year, four criminal tax evasion charges, possible 34 years in jail. When I walked into the courtroom that morning, I was prepared, you know, embrace your fear. I wasn't sure I would be given bail if it went against me, so I could have just gone directly to jail. But the three justices of the Court of Tax Appeals acquitted me and Rappler and made it go away like that, 34 years, and I had 34 years back. So don't be distracted in your search for meaning. What you do today matters. You, class of 2023, will define what our democracy will look like, what it will evolve to, and please make no mistake, these are American tech companies that began, oh my gosh, starting, uh, the earth won't open up, it's only a, <laughs> it's only a, a joke. Um, so you will determine how our democracy will survive and evolve, and frankly, for the 2024 elections that you will have, it will be one of the tipping points for whether globally democracy can survive. So this is a time of creative destruction. Even as we step on the rubble of the world that was, remember that you, are creating the future now. Please make sure it's the future you want. So get ready for battle, draw the line, know your values, embrace your fear, and build your community, but beware the mob. We're literally living in science fiction times, and our fate is in your hands. Your umbrellas are out. I got to take a picture of this. I'm so sorry I'm not holding an umbrella that I'm not with you in here, but look, guys, congratulations. Congratulations. Hug each other, enjoy the moment, be with the people you love. Congratulations, class of 2023. One more time, right? I want you to sleep well tonight because you will have to dream of a much better future than what we have now. Then you go and make it happen. You go, class of 2023. I'm sorry it's raining. <laughs> Thank you, Maria, for your powerful and passionate remarks. It's one thing to talk about free speech and fighting censorship in the abstract, and quite another to hear from someone who has put her life on the line for those values. Your story has given us courage and inspiration for engaging on these issues in our own lives. Class of 2023, this brings our Graduate, program, graduate Day program to a close. Thank you for gathering with us today. As you heard, get a good night's sleep. Enjoy the rest of your day. We look forward to welcoming you tomorrow morning for our commencement ceremony. Good afternoon. <laughs>